There we go. Apologize now. I've got a streaming cold. So if you hear them coughing and sneezing in the background, it'll be me. And I'll probably doze off during Martin's presentation anyway. So, <laughs> um, so welcome everybody. A few bits of news which will rattle through as fast as we can. Uh, our next meeting will be on the 13th of April. We've still got one slot unfilled if we have a volunteer. Uh, everybody take a step backwards so that one person can take a step forward, as it were. But anyway, 13th of April, slightly different because we haven't had a business meeting for uh, years, I think. So we're going to start half an hour early on that day for a business meeting and talk about what money we've got in the bank. And Martin and I say any volunteers to be you know, chair or the secretary and nobody says anything, the usual stuff. Um, so half an hour early, if you're a member of the TSF, which most of you are, um, please come to the business meeting. Uh, but then the meeting itself will start at the usual time. So that's the 13th of April. We're not having one of these meetings in May because we're hoping to have our conference, a one day conference in Gloucester. Um, we're hoping to do it in person, although a lot of people, a lot of organizations are having trouble getting people to actually come out anymore, but it will be online as well. Um, that's 13th of May in Gloucester, all being well, a Saturday. And we need speakers for that. We have some, but not enough. And the cutoff date uh, for proposal proposed papers is 20th of March. The usual email addresses, myself or the TSF website. Um, and then one other thing, this coming Wednesday uh, is the Vaughan Willis Memorial Library lecture number three in the library lecture series, this series, uh, Oscar Cox Jensen talking about street singers, presumably of the 19th century, but um, I think the title is How to Be a Street Singer, so maybe there'll be some instructional stuff. Anyway, that's... that's yeah, um, can I query 13 April? I, I, I think that's a Thursday. Uh, have I written it down wrong? It's a Wednesday. Have I written down the date wrong? Anyway, it's this coming Wednesday, isn't it? The April TSF. At, where, where are the 13th of April? That's a Thursday. Okay. Yeah, I've written it down wrong. 23rd of April. All right, then. <laughs> I told you I had a cold. Our meeting is the 23rd of April. Sorry. But Vaughan Williams one is... On this coming Wednesday, whatever whatever date that is. Okay, anyway, let's go to today's meeting. We have a newcomer to us, I think, Alan Roach, who's going to talk about Little Musgrave, who we all know very well, I'm sure. So over to you, Alan. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. That's looking good. Good. All right. Well, first of all, many thanks to all of you for uh, in advance for listening to me and uh, to Stephen, to a number of people uh, who don't know me, but whose work I know who are in the audience. Um, and uh, I won't say anything more because I don't want to take up too much time. Uh, and uh, forgive me if I offend. I come at um, folk music perhaps from a different slightly different approach but forgive me if i step on any toes i will be stepping on martin's toes very briefly all right in the last few decades we seem to have lost our appreciation for the value of the ballad as a medium comparable to other forms of popular literature such as the novel and lyric poetry and even the graphic novel part of this loss may be due to the lack of appreciation for the form structure and narrative and dexterity of the ballad itself riddling ballads like Scarborough Fair, have been critical in the shaping of modern thought and contemporary narrative, yet they are almost entirely forgotten as a genre. Nevertheless, auditors and readers alike have not only been shaped by these ballads, but appreciate them in renewed way when encountering or even when re-encountering them. 
One of the problems with the study of ballads and broadsides derives from one of the strengths of the ball of ballad scholarship. It makes perfect sense, as you all know, to investigate the variant forms, the distribution, and the provenance of ballads. But fascinating though this may be, when I teach the ballad in the classroom, my students are much more interested in close readings and the significance of the content of the ballad itself, knowing full well, at least I know full well, that content is never static. And surely writers such as Thomas Hardy, a true musician in his own right, uh, have that interpretive approach in mind when drawing on ballads uh, within their text. Hardy, for example, who uses a number of ballads, uh, employs The Boy in the Mantle, uh, Child 29, Route 3961, in Tess of the D'Urbervilles, uh, which was published in 1891, not merely for the sake of illusion, but to acknowledge that Tess's one indiscretion, albeit a forced one, is not new to culture or to society, but has been inscribed and forgiven since the days of King Arthur. Um, and this is the passage that uh, from Hardy. Tess did return upstairs and put on the gown. Alone, she stood for a moment before the glass, looking at the effect of her silk attire. And then, the, I know you can read this on your, on your own. Uh, and she tries on the mystic robe that never would become that wife that had done amiss. Um, and so in some sense, uh, Hardy's very much aware of the illusion that he's making here. And of course, uh, it was, that ballad was much more prominent in its time than uh, perhaps it is now. Uh, as far as I know, there aren't very many recorded versions of The Boy in the Mantle, but uh, and this is the only painting I could find, uh, which Stephen suggested might be a bit scandalous, but uh, there we are. So there's Queen Guinevere um, uh, being refute, refuted for her virginity by the mantle. Um, but in this case, um, Readers here are meant to recognize the duplicity of uh, the aristocratic Lady Guinevere, as opposed to Lady Craddock, whose clear honesty and her claim for purity is acknowledged by the mantle, which glitters and is radiant on her. Once I did amiss, she says, uh, when Craddock's mouth I kissed under a green tree, when I kissed Craddock's mouth before he married me. Uh, and I should note, and many of you know this, that uh, in other versions of the ballad, she does more than kiss Craddock. Um, but it's only with Craddock that she has this relationship. The ballad here is a useful tool for Victorians, but more to the point, it suggested a different kind of colloquially understanding of the text, which was filled with meaning and which resonated with, an, with impact for early audiences. Now, not to step on Martin's toes, whoops, I'm jumping ahead, not to step on Martin's toes, uh, but I promised him I would, I do want to mention Mary Hamilton in Virginia Woolf's Room of One's Own, which was published in 1929. While most readers recall or refer to her imaginary representation of Shakespeare's sister, Judith, Woolf is equally adamant about the social injustice inflicted on Mary Hamilton, who paradoxically is executed for killing a child of adultery, um, which ultimately would have been, uh, in either case, a fatal, uh, result in a fatal income for her. Okay, so to move on to uh, the topic at hand, the purpose of my presentation here on Maddie Groves, uh, which is part of a larger collection, I hope, of essays, is to restore attention to meaning, the significance, and the historical context in ballads by looking at familiar examples of the genre. By drawing on these examples, as I've hinted previously, we can see how ballads function as complex narratives by looking at the devices that ballads rely upon. I have listened to Maddie Grove since I was a child, and so I have chosen to explore a little Musgrave, which easily dates back to 1613, slightly before my time. Um, the ballad too often read superficially, one reader uh, that I, uh, I won't quote, but one reader calls it, quote, a simple bit of hanky-panky actually augments what appears to be an uncomplicated story in order to give the reader a sense of ironic yet pointed discourse. As you probably know, the Musgrave Barnard affair, as I chose choose to call it, uh, begins in a church on a holy day, sometimes construed as the first one of the year, but almost always never a unique holy day of the year. 
And of course, there are 50, at least at least 52 commonplace holy days in the year. So this day may not be particularly meaningful except for the Musgrave Barnard encounter. Lady Barnard is elegantly dressed and Musgrave, though ostensibly his objective is to come and hear some holy words, is fully mesmerized by her, holy words notwithstanding. And clearly she is mesmerized by him. In every version, the actual sanctity of the church and of the day is absolutely secondary. And the ballad avoids making their liaison an infraction against any kind of divine law. None of the characters are punished by God as much as they are by their own appetites. And given the secular nature of this very brief romance, it's critical to pay attention to the attempts to warn them of the danger that they're in. A little page devoted to Lord Barnard runs swiftly and tenaciously to Lord Barnard to let him know of Lady Barnard's, excuse me, Lady Barnard's betrayal. On the other side of the coin, one of Lord Barnard's men, who is devoted to Musgrave, tries to alert him of Barnard's approach by blowing his horn. The two opposing yet devoted loyalists are not only secular, but courageous in their dedication to the people they serve. Thus, if there are any heroes in this tale, and I really doubt that there are, they represent the common people. Musgrave, who is caught by Lord Barnard in his wife's bed, replies to Lord Barnard's sarcastic request with a, ki uh, excuse me, with a kind of impudence that educates the auditor about witty, albeit ultimately fatal repartee. Uh, and it's in the form of these questions. How do you like my bed, Musgrave? And how do you like my sheets? And how do you like my fair lady that lies in your arms asleep? And Musgrave, uh, with cheeky uh, impudence, responds, it's well I like your bed, it's well I like your sheets, and better I like your fair lady that lies in my, um, in my arms asleep. Um, uh, no doubt by this time she's fully awake, but we'll leave it at that. The verbal exchange here sets aside moralistic or even aggressive language for, the fo for a form of banter calculated to intrigue and amuse the auditor. And the wordplay is extended to Lady Barnard after Little Musgrave is dispatched by her husband, who once again resorts to irony, but uh, this time in an, in an effort to extract an expression of either love or fear from his wife. And her response is no less impudent than that of the now dead uh, Little Musgrave. How do you like uh, his cheeks, lady, and how do you like his chin? Uh, now that there's no life within. And she responds again with impudence, not with um, a plea for her life and not with a um, sort of refuting and sort of saying, and, and there are different versions of this, of course, refuting and saying, oh, now I really love you. I recognize or truly love you, Lord Barnard. Um, Lady Barnard loses her life with this response, yet she maintains both the integrity of her identi identity and the authenticity of her love. If there are moral lessons in this ballad, uh, they have nothing to do with adultery or with so-called sin, but rather with the significance of skilled language over action. While it is true that Musgrave and Lady Barnard do not survive the narrative, they have in a sense defeated the now widowed and isolated Lord Barnard by undermining his brutality, his language, and of course his future. In a ballad that is about an illicit sexual encounter, it's also worth listening to the often not so subtle, although subtextual, images of sexuality. In some versions of the ballad, Lord Barnard, after defeating Little Musgrave, then kills Lady Barnard in a significant way. And he's taken up his long, long sword to strike a mortal blow and through and through the lady's heart, the called the italics, italics are mine, uh, to strike a mortal blow. Of course, Lord Barnard has clearly been unable to touch Lady Barnard's heart in any way except for this one, much less with the passion and the emotion that she felt from Musgrave. It's not surprising, therefore, that this is the only way in, um, the only way in which Lord Barnard can reach her heart, but it, was, it is with cold and unforgiving steel. And while a sword is just a, often just a sword, just as a cigar is often just a cigar, it's well worth noting that the little naked Musgrave <clears throat> who encounters Barnard, does not have a sword, or at least any more, or at least doesn't have one after his dalliance with Lady Barnard. Thus he must borrow one from the distant and aloof Lord Barnard, who can only wield his sword as an instrument of death, rather than perhaps of love. Uh, I'm trying to be subtle here. Uh, not well. 
The audience for Little Musgrave was comprised mostly of commoners and perhaps illiterate for whom the wordplay of these witty exchanges outshone their own daily conversation. But for the same reason, this new language with new figures of speech was both exciting and appealing. They were certainly also attracted to the fact that gentrified people who were no better than they were came, um, were no better than they were when it came to dealing with love, sex, and jealousy. Ultimately, there's no real moral lesson to be learned in Little Musgrave. It's a story in which almost nobody, absolutely nobody wins. But that's a lesson in its own right and one well, well worth remembering. Thus, along with the audiences of the past, we learn how to express ourselves, perhaps with some additional wit and irony through literature, culture, and the ballad. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. That was that was great. <laughs> Sorry, I, I wasn't asleep. I was just wondering about the sword. Yes. Analogy, which it had to occur to me before, but will from now on forevermore. <laughs> whenever I hear the ballad, um, we do have plenty of time because Alan's very good. Um, we have plenty of time for questions and and comments. Uh, and I also like the um the fact that it's referred to as hanky panky. <laughs> Although hanky panky with a with a long sword, I don't think fit. Anyway, we won't go there. So Sue, Sue's got first first hand up. Hello, Sue. Thank you. Um, I just wonder, Alan, do do you think it's as much about power as it is about sex and love? Well, in some sense. Uh, my my audio is on, right? In some sense, I do think power comes into it, but I think it also undermines power, and I think it undermines power in the sense that Lord Barnard is essentially nobody after uh, the events of the of the ballad, in the sense that uh, he's now a widower, uh, he's murdered um, Little Musgrave, who must be some person of reasonable significance, and his future is uncertain. What's more is that he's been outwitted in, in, with his own repartee. So ultimately, I think the power is, uh, and, and finally, uh, I'll just say, this is why I mentioned uh, the two servants, um, that in some sense, uh, they are wielding a certain amount of power behind the scenes um, that in fact undermine whatever uh, huge power that he might have. So it makes the powerless who are singing the ballad to uh, perpetuating the ballad feel more powerful, perhaps. Right. But ultimately, um, uh, I, I don't know that the power um, dyad applies. In other words, uh, as I said, it's a ballad in which nobody wins. Um, nobody ultimately emerges as... Uh, more, you can't be more dead than the next person. <laughs> and, um, and uh, you know, for the servants, uh, you know, they've had their chance and they've demonstrated some kind of integrity. And if there's power anywhere, anywhere, it's in the integrity of their attempts to um, uphold um, some sense of the uh, quality of their, the people they serve. Um, uh, I mean, one of the questions that we don't ask, I mean, that, you know, we don't have evidence for, but is, of course, why on this holy day is Lord Barnard away? I mean, he's either um, bringing the sheep to fold or um, he's away for some reason that is, is unexplained. So that in some sense, uh, we can say the servant who uh, blows the horn for the sake of... Um, I mean, I'm over reading this right now, so forgive me, but the servant who blows a horn for a little Musgrave uh, may have had to do this once or twice before <laughs> for other kinds of dalliances. Yes, sorry. Uh, Fra Frankie, Frankie's waving. Hello, Frankie. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Okay, thanks, Alan. But um, I've got a version, the one I do, and I have no recollection as to all the decades ago where I got it from, but that has a slightly different right. um, plot, 
aspects to the plot which changes issues because the power thing seems to me to be about the fact that like many women she was married off to Lord Barnard probably because of property and uh, you know women were had to do marriage was to do with property and money and so you know any of those ballads where a married woman falls for a for younger man or a you know, uh, more desirable man seem to me to be a, about the role of women uh, anyway so that's about power but also the version I do says Lord Barnett has a hunting gone to hunt the fallow deer his vassals they have gone with him his company to bear so that's why he's away but also when it comes to the little foot page it says and woe be to that little foot page when he's run off to the green woods to tell Lord Barnard uh, and an ill death may he die so you're definitely not on his side in this version and then most crucially in this version it's not one of Lord Barnard's servants who blow the horn it's Lord Barnard himself crying yeah. It's time that, uh, oh, how do, how do those verses go? They're repeated three times. And now to, uh, I, I can't say this without singing, um, but it's clear that he's he is warning uh, little Musgrave. It's time you were away. And and then in frustration, on the third time he blows it, he he flings his horn down and runs up the steps. So the sense is that your sympathy is with everybody, and yet the circumstances they find themselves in end up with nobody winning, as you say. So I find it just one of the most moving ballads I have ever got my my tongue round. And so it's just an, a slightly different version, but it does shift the you know, the, the kind of morality of it from your interpretation. No, it's a nice interpretation and the variants do to some extent, uh, re, you know, and I've, I've read as many variants as I possibly could. Um, and needless to say, uh, drilled down on one uh, most, most familiar one. But the fact that Lord Barnard um, uh, blows the horn in one version or alerts um, a little Musgrave. I mean, it's in the version that I'm using, it's partly that he's uh, he's not necessarily interested in this violent um, encounter. I mean, he knows, in, he says, in England, I shall never, it shall never be said that I slew a sleeping man, um, which in some sense indicates that uh, he's arrived at a situation, A, where he doesn't want to see Musgrave and B, he doesn't want to have uh, that confrontation. Um, and uh, if I can go further, is that um, he knows exactly what you're saying, and that is that uh, this will lead to no good end for anybody, much less himself. Right, we need to move on, and then we've got two more people yeah. waiting to ask. So, Abby, if you've got a brief question, Abby Sale. Steve, Michael I, Bell has been waving his hands for some time. Oh, sorry. Michael Bell. Right. If, if you want to ask a question, people, you go down to um, reactions at the bottom and, and put, raise your hand. So, all right, Abby first and then Michael. But you're going to be brief now because we're running out of time. I've always been fascinated with John Jacob Niles' possible creation of uh, the backstory on the shepherd uh, on the the servant that blows his horn he felt that it has to be some backstory an important one of why he's risking his own life to warn Matty Groves have you ever found in all your reading any other justification than uh, Niles saying this existed uh not really I mean I think it does come up in a couple of versions I think one of the things um that I like about it and I'm not particularly a good musician but there is a, a musical moment when he blows his horn that merges with the text and says, away, Musgrave, away. And, and for those of you who really enjoy the ballad, there's that moment when the music itself, it's, it's almost like the blues, the music itself echoes that, uh, that horn sound and away, Musgrave, away. But I don't, have, I don't have anything that I can point to. But if anybody wants to point to it for me, that'd be appreciated. 
I appreciate that. Thank you, Alan. Michael, Thank next. You. Michael? You're muted, Michael. That's it. Alan, very quickly, um, you spoke about the wit in the exchange you put on the screen, but in a very real sense, it's failed wit. In other words, they're being witty, but they're not succeeding. I'm, I mean, the other argument is in the folk world, good wit always wins. That mm -hmm. if I can best you in words, I don't need to best you with swords. But right. clearly here, it's failed wit, which connects to uh, Frankie's idea about power and how words get used in certain kinds of relationships. Equals can be witty with each other, but people who are not social equals have to engage in games of deference rather than in games of challenge. Right. Well, I think just another rhetorical point to think about in terms of the text mm -hmm. is, that, is, is the idea of how wit functions in this ballad to call attention either to the dangers of its use Mm -hmm. or to the consequences of using it with the wrong person. Right. And and I agree and I in in many many ways although I disagree in one respect and I'll be very brief about this is that wit can be uh, a substitute for something perhaps a little bit more primitive and that is anger or base reaction. And that's certainly what finally when we have the repartee between Barnard and uh, Musgrave um with uh, Lady Barnard, uh, in getting back a little bit to what Frankie Armstrong was saying, is that uh, she she doesn't uh, reduce herself to any kind of rhetorical play, which is a plea for her life or an accusation of anger or anything else. Um, it is basically turning uh, Barnard's um, own reaction against him. So there's another, I think there's another function of wit there, which, but I appreciate what you're saying. Okay, we'll have to talk about that last piece, but we do need to move on. Okay, yeah, thank, thank you, right. Michael. Uh, last question, please, from Gloria. Thanks for waiting, Gloria. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to raise the, a question about the possibility of multiple interpretation of this <laughs> ballad and probably almost all of them. And I'm thinking particularly of John Cohen's uh, recording of the magnificent singer Dillard Chandler in North Carolina. I think it was in the 1960s. And in the album, uh, he put out an album called Dillard Chandler, the end of an old song. And as always, John Cohen's liner notes are pretty remarkable. But in his note on Matty Groves, that I think that's what it was called in Dillard singing Matty Groves. Mm -hmm. um, he also, he didn't, re, uh, he didn't, provided the album, but he just put a, a set of dialogues in the liner notes. Uh, after uh, he recorded this on uh, Dillard Chandler's porch. So it's a you know, quasi natural environment because it was his friends and neighbors and relatives who were there as they might be on any night to hear a singer. But he talks about, there were two paragraphs, I think it was. And as, as soon as the ballad ended, all the people there sort of chimed in on interpreting the ballad. And mm -hmm. some of them thought that, you know, Lord, uh, the Lord Barnard was at fault. Some thought yeah. that Matty Groves was at fault. Some thought that Lady Barnard was at fault. And then they talked about what they would have done, you know, as one of those, one or more of those characters, what they would have done in that situation and say, well, if I were a little must, you know, Matty Groves, I would have done this. If I was Lord Barnard, I would have done that. And that, among many other things, convinced me that it, you know, that one might need to not pin down the meaning of any of these because so much of it for for singers and for their audiences, you know, is is um, is diverse. Their reactions are diverse. Their interpretations are diverse. And and since this is, you know, the, the, that's one of my most striking examples of that was um, Dillard Chandler's Matty Grove. So you know particularly came to mind listening to talk about your Roy Musgrave. So I wonder if you could say anything about that. Okay, if, where's um, Stephen? Yeah, two uh, two I'll, minutes. I'll give it very quickly. Um, yeah, uh, of course, part of my job uh, or uh, as an interpreter or as a, a literary critic or whatever is is to find an interpretation that I think suits the text. 
but uh, in picking up on the people, the way that people responded, that plays exactly into one of the things that I say, and that is that everybody in um, a situation of sexual, of, first of all, adultery and of uh, sexual attraction and uh, negligence and brutality, everybody is at fault. Um, so that the fact that uh, individuals want to pick sides and are uncertain of which sides to pick, and there's, you know, three sides at least here, uh, that's not surprising because in some sense um, they are um, they are all at fault. And so, depending again on the version, some are more at fault than others. Uh, or not, I can't even say that. I mean, in, in some, I mean, Lady Barnard comes down dressed in, in the finest uh, silk attire of all. Um, and so that, you know, uh, and what it also, you know, church is at fault, uh, because, uh, I, I, I didn't attend church. I attended synagogue, but, uh, when I was a uh, little Musgrave's age, a little older, a little younger, um, church was an opportunity maybe to, uh, meet someone. <laughs> and, uh, so that in some sense, the, the holy day is a holy day that functions in a different context as well. Uh, it's a so church is a social venue, not merely a religious venue. So uh, everything is at fault all at once, um, and I'll leave it there. Right, I think we'd better vote on 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 who was at fault and who wasn't at a, at a future meeting. Although, poor old, I think we should hear it for Lord Barnard. I mean, all he was, he was just going hunting, poor chap, and it, you know, it gets called back to his, you know. Anyway, so I don't think he was at hunting fault. on Sunday. Yeah. Oh well. The holy right. day. Okay. So <laughs> let's move. Let's move on. Thank you very much, Alan. That thank was great. Thank you, everyone. A lot of talking and thinking. Um, and I hope we'll hear from you again. So we're going to move on to John. John Baxter, one of our regular contributors, who is going to be a young man from the country. If I remember rightly, yes, there he is. We have that. Thank you, John. But we can't hear you. You can, you can hear me now. Oh, we can Good. now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm talking about uh, this. Is, this is very modern stuff compared to what all, what you've just been talking about. This is only 160 years old, so so it's it's positively rock and roll. Uh, comparatively, but I'm going to talk about mostly about two songs, or you could argue a much greater number uh, about, uh, related to this uh, this first song, The Young Man from the Country Who Kept Company With Me uh, and and an early variant of it, The Young Man from the Country you, But You Don't Get Over Me. Um, Nick Dow sent me an email to say, what did I know about A Young Man from the, the first of these two songs? And it turned out much less than I, much less than I thought. And it led me down a rabbit hole that I've been in much 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 of the time since that since that that first query a couple of months ago if people know these songs they may know them from the collections of roy palmer the first appeared in his book about history of england and the second appeared in his english country songbook but before i before i uh, talk about the songs i wanted to talk about what people understood by the phrase a young man from the country i've said a young person from the country because sometimes it was a young girl from the country it was a phrase often used in, in, in ads to do with employment. People would be seeking a, a young man from the country or, or offering their services as a young man from the country. And I've got a series of, of adverts here that I took, took, took I did sampled once every decade uh, between about 1750 and about 1900. And there, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of these adverts which, which are looking for a young, a, a young man from the country, a young girl from the country clicking through to my favorite one my favorite one is uh, wanted a servant and a small family a young man from the country he must be well recommended for his activity sobriety and honesty no oxford servant or person who has lived in oxford need apply uh, such will not be engaged so either they've got something against oxford or they've had a bad experience with a servant from oxford but the this i this this idea that the phrase meant something other than simply a young man from the country it clearly had some sort of evolving social meaning and my reading is that certainly in the early period when people were advertising for a young man in the country they were advertising for someone that was trustworthy 
and to be honest, cheap, that wasn't going to charge the rates that, that someone who'd been living in the city for a while would, would be saying. But also we have to be aware that, that the young person, a young man from the country, was often seen as a figure of fun, as someone slow-witted, and, and that, that, that might be ripped off when they arrived in the city. Uh, and that's, that's the, the sort of theme of the songs. The first song of this name was performed as, a, as part of a theatrical piece by actress Priscilla Reed. Words were by William Bruff, and music was by Thomas German Reed. Now, in the late 90s, I think the German Reeds are quite important in terms of popular music and theatre in the 19th century, but they're not they're not music hall figures as such, which is obviously, as some of you will know, my area of expertise if I have one. Uh, so the German Reeds in the late 1850s presented a series of entertainments called Popular Illustrations of Real Life. And these tended to consist of several short two-handed performances, pointedly not called plays, as these did not take place in theatres. They took place in more respectable venues like concert halls. Forgive my language, but if you were a respectable middle-class man, you wouldn't take your wife or indeed your children to the theatre because it was a disreputable place. That that changed in the second half of the, of, of the 19th century in, in the British Isles, but but only as a result of people like the German Reeds who were deliberately developing entertainments that were seen as respectable and not as as, uh, as naughty as the theatre was seen. So their, 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 their performances were often comedic, but also often had underlying moral, moral, moral lessons. And I should say that they went on to be very successful and a whole number of actors and songwriters from light opera had their start with the German Reeds, notably W.F. Gilbert of Gilbert and Sullivan, was was in, was in a, worked with the German Reeds early on. It was in another part of his career. Um, so this song was sung uh, in the character of Sally Skeggs. You can see from the picture that uh, that there's something of a comedic. She's something of a comedic figure. At the same time, almost almost contemporary with the performance in the English theatre. About six months or a year later, uh, the actor William H. Stevens was singing the song to Australian audiences to great acclaim during his tour of 1860. Okay, so it was a hugely successful song. How do we measure that? Well, one way to measure it is to look at the number of different places it was printed. You can see that in the UK, it was printed, with five, there were five different broadsides on official publications. There were at least five different uh, songsters and chapbooks that, that appeared, and these are only ones that survived. In America, exactly the same text was published, almost exactly the same text was published in several songbooks that were collecting material related to Tony Pastor's vaudeville performances and his company. In in the UK, it was published as sheet music, how many times is it there? About six times. They kept reversion it. They reversioned it as a quadrille, sort of a dance. They they reversioned it for simpler piano. Uh, they reversioned it for for piano with cornet accompaniment. They reversioned it as as piano duets. And this gives you an indication that the publishers were trying to milk this extremely popular tune uh, that uh, you know that they had that that German Reed had written for them. Moving on, so. As I said the version, the earliest version that we have of the song was published in the Morning Post in June 1859 as part of a very sympathetic review of a performance by the German Reeds. And it's almost exactly the same words were collected a hundred years later from the singer Fanny Hunger, Ken Stott in 1869. I'll play you a couple of stanzas of Fanny singing it, and you may be able to follow if you're able to the first two stanzas, which are almost identical. <laughs> when I first went to service, the nursemaid's place I took, there was me and Jane the housemaid, and Margaret the cook, and all of us had followers, but the best of all the three was that young man from the country that kept company with me. The first time that he came to tea, the snow lay on the ground. Next morning, master's overcoat was nowhere to be found. Although I saw it hanging there when we sit down to tea with that young man from the country that kept company with me. Next time. So what we've got is a series of verses in a, in a single narrative describing how things keep disappearing from the house 
And in the end, it turns out that, strangely enough, it's the young man from the country that's been nicking all the stuff from the house uh, and that the, 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 the housemaid get, and the cook and all the other servants get sacked. So this is, this, is, this is a song where the audience is being invited to have no sympathy at all for the person uh, that's being lambasted. I'm not saying that's how it was being sung by Fanny Pronger. Clearly, she, she, she was singing it in a different way. And I also should comment on, the, on, on Mrs. Pronger singing in that it may be the way it was recorded that meant that the refrain wasn't repeated. There is a repeat refrain at the end of each verse that's in the original music and, and in most performances. Um, but yes, I describe it as a, as a series of incidents, larcenous incidents in a single moral, moral narrative uh, and exactly the same song with, um, with almost no changes at all is pu was, was published in America and sung uh, by either by Tony Pastor himself, who we'll come on to, or by a member of his company. There were, there were innumerable parodies of, of, of the song, uh, which is another measure of pop popularity. J. A. Hardwick, who was a well-known performer and songwriter in the early musicals of London, uh, wrote three different parodies, two of which he sung himself, and one of which was sung by uh, Miss Seagrave, who was a, a character actress, they call it as a person that sang in, in character. It was also, uh, uh, there was also a parody produced in Scotland, which starts when first I claim came to Glasgow town, et cetera. And that was by Robert Anderson, who was a, 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 a person that appeared in the halls. We know very little about Robert Anderson, but he did appear in the music halls in Scotland. I'm trying to move quickly on. Right, so the most important reversioning came when Harry Sidney rewrote the, wrote a whole new set of lyrics, completely unrelated to the first, but to the same tune. Uh, um, and he, both he and, ha and William Randall sang the song in the music halls. And there was, they had a bit of a dispute about who it was written for, but it's not clear how the dispute was resolved. It was, it was agreed that it was written by Harry Sidney. William Randall believed it was written for him and no one else. And, they had a bit of a spat in the press, but it, it was resolved and they both kept singing it. They were both, I'm not going to give full biographies of, of Harry Sidney and William Randall, but they were both important figures in the early music hall. They were both known to extemporize, to make things up as they were going along. And they were both known to favor uh, contemporary songs, songs that commented on contemporary events. And it may be that they were singing variants on the, the, the material that was published as and sheet music. So this song was a huge hit in its own right. And I'm going to again show the different places it was published in the UK. It was published in two different songsters that I've been able to find and three different broadsides that probably underestimates uh, uh, its impact. It was published once as sheet music, but it was reversioned by Tony Pastor. We're going to come on to that again. I keep saying that. Uh, and it, was, it appeared in innumerable collections of Tony Pastor's songs and a four and four different broadsides. So this too was a song, was a very popular song. In some ways, it may have outshadowed the, the previous one. So here's the lyrics as printed in the sheet music. And the first verse is, I'm a young man from the country, from Lancashire I came, a free and easy fellow, there's no need to tell my name. I know my way about a bit with both eyes I can see. I'm a young man from the country, but you don't get over me. And it ends, you think I'm fond of singing. The charge I own is true. Who would not be delighted to amuse such friends as you? I sang two songs before this. I don't, you won't want more than three. I'm a young man from the country, but you don't get over me. So he steps outside of his narrative, which is a series of uncon unlinked, it's not a single narrative, but a series of events in which people in London try and rip off the young man from the country and he refuses to be fooled. And that structure is maintained in, in the broadside versions, but the broadside versions published in the UK, I've shown the first and the last verse here, are three different, are three different broadsides, are different from the sheet music. So the sheet music presents one version of the song, it's clearly the same song. It can be sung to the same tune, but the broadsides are far more consistent than the original uh, sheet music. So it's not clear exactly where the ver where it, well, it's likely that, that I think that the versions that we see printed in broadsides were more like what was being sung 
uh, in on, from the stages as Harry, Sydney, William Randall, and possibly other, other performers went around singing. So, like many musical songs, it starts with a geographical location that can be changed to fit the audience. Um, and all the versions on broadside end with the singer getting married and don't end with the stepping outside the narrative to um, talk about sing, singing songs for you. Okay, so uh, let's. Cyril Boucher sang a version of the, of the song, which is almost nothing like the sheet music, apart from a tune, uh, but which is very like the broadside. So I'll play you a couple of stanzas of Cyril Poacher singing it. <laughs> Oh, yeah, please, ladies and gentlemen, I have my friend now to call our friend Mr. C.P. Jasper Zide for the small ditty. It was down in Northamptonshire where I heard of various news. All the shams and fences, a mighty London town. So I took it into my head one day, I'd tramp that place to see. I'm a young man from the country, but I'm far too wide awake. Oh, I'm a young man from the country, but I'm far too wide awake. As I stand staring in the shop window, had a handsome chain and a golden locket. A London chap behind me stepped, shoved his hand into my pocket. Says, I, oh, young man, your hand is in the wrong place, and you're making it rather free. I'm a young man from the country, but you won't pickpocket me. Oh, I'm a young man from the country, but you won't pickpocket me. And another chef. I was stuck there, doing very well there. Uh, he, he, I think it's, I think it's Cyril himself that may well have introduced Northamptonshire to the first line rather than Lancashire. And he, he's a, it's a bit fast and loose with how he finishes each stanza. It, it can vary from different performances, but nonetheless, it's very similar to to the to the version on on broadside. I should say the song was also collected by Richard Withers of Oxfordshire by Cecil Sharp. Uh, uh, oh gosh, I just uh, managed to change the screen without meaning to. Yeah, so Richard Withers uh, sang it for, for Cecil Sharp, but he sang something quite different. He sang, I'm a young man from the country and you can't get over me, so you needn't come flashing. You shan't come again. No, you shan't come again. No, you shan't come again. You needn't come flattering. You shall not come again. And that's unique. I, I can't find that reproduced anywhere else. So where that particular version of the song came from, I don't know, but when it's been collected from Appalachian singers, notably Harvey M. Dan, it was the, the American reversioning that I'm going to talk about in a moment. Before I do that, I just want to mention one uh, prominent reversioning in the UK, which was the Bullerwell and Summers Race by George Rid Ridley, great time side songwriter and performer who, uh, who who, who wrote the song, well, wrote a description of a, a race between Summers and Bullerwell, ending each stanza with, uh, says, Bob, I come from Bladen, and you, you'll not get over me. My Northeast accent is terrible. But that was being performed in the early 1860s as well. Um, one, as, one assumes, well, it says it's performed to the uh, original tune. But... The American variants, the earliest American variant was The Young Man from the Country as sung by Tony Pasta, which we see here in American Broadside. And it starts, I'm a young man from the country from <laughs> Skunnick to the I came. I should never have started this. I cannot be uh, pronouncing that word has been, been the bane of my life, Skunnick to the. And, and there may be a double joke in there, in that Skunnick to the, is a fairly industrial part of New York State. It was even at that time around the Mohawk River. And in the 1860s, there was a wave of immigration from Ireland uh, to, to, to take up employment in, in the industries around the Mohawk, Mohawk River. And it may be that the song is a veiled reference to these new Irish arrivals 
uh, in the States. So it wouldn't be at all surprising if Tony Pasta was uh, uh, mocking them in, in this sort of way. But again, there was a, a version, a, a ladies version, excuse my language, in inverted commas, that started I'm a young girl from the country, from Jersey I came, my native place is Hackensack, but I shan't tell my name. So those, the main version in America is, is, the, is the one from Skunik Tuddy. Uh, and, and that has been collected, as I say, from Appalachian source singers. Just to add even more grist to the mill, Tony Pasta and his dodgy moustache were responsible for yet another version uh, called Verdant Green, where he rewrote the song uh, as being my name is Verdant Green and the country I, from the country I came, I arrived in town last Monday by the 7.30 train. It follows, again, the same format, a series of events in which people from the city try to rip off some from the country, but fail. Um, so, yeah, I just thought I'd throw that one in because it may be the source of uh, my favourite one so far, which is I'm a young man from Canada. And... Uh, this was uh, collected in the 1860s by James Anderson, who wrote Sawney's Letters and Caribou Rhymes, which were a series of verse letters and songs that he wrote himself and collected during the Caribou Roll Gold Rush of the 1860s. So I'll play the first stanza of a young man from Canada. I'm a young man from Canada some six feet in my shoes I left my home for caribou on the first exciting news in New York City I met a gent introduced himself to me said I I come from Canada so you can't come over me said I I come from Canada so you can't come over me the song it's an entirely different song if you like but it follows the same structure it's a series of events in which people try and rip off the young man from Canada, but he knows what he's doing because he's a young man from Canada and you can't come over me. So that is the end of the songs I'm going to talk about. If I can just navigate to my last page. Um, I want to thank Nick Dow, Steve Garden, Steve Roud for their assistance, although all the mistakes and, uh, and, uh, uh, and the exaggerations are my own. Uh, there are lots more. There are lots more things you can do. I haven't uh, tried to trace all the songs that have used a young man from the country as the air, and there are many. So, for example, there's an interesting song called "The New Chum," which which was sung in New Zealand about the gold rush there, which was set to the tune of of a young man from the country, but but otherwise is largely unrelated. It would be interesting to look at how the music evolved over time, because we have a, a stable starting point. It would be interesting to work out whether German Reed's tune is indeed original. Uh, I'm not completely confident that it was, but, uh, but there we go. And, it w and the other thing that I have done a little bit of work on is tracing its performance in amateur, con amateur contexts. The Harry Sidney song, the second song, it was widely sung in amateur concerts between about 1890 and, and the early 20th century. It's much harder to find examples of the German Reed song, the, the one involving the, the housemaid. Um, I've not been able to find exact amateur examples of that in the late 19th century. Hope you found it useful and you don't think I've wasted my time down that particular uh, rabbit hole, so I'll stop there. Right, thank you. Thank you, John. As, as always with your papers, I start off thinking that I know something, as you said at the beginning. We think this is quite simple and it turns out to be really, really complicated, which is just how I like it. Can I, can I ask, John, is there a biography of, of German Reed? I'm afraid I've relied on internet sources. I, I don't know of a written book biography. You can find a lot of information about him uh, on the web, but um, I've not found a, a, a book. Right. Okay. I'm not saying there isn't one, there may be one. Because there's lots of people like that that are, are really important to this 19th century 
you know, song industry and so on, and we know very little about an awful yeah. lot of them. I mean, it's a new thing for me because it's so aimed at the respectable middle classes. Yeah. Um, and as I say, it, it's if you like Gilbert and Sullivan, you could argue that Jim Reed is responsible for Gilbert and Sullivan. If you have your doubts about them, then you could blame Jim and Reed for, for Gilbert and Sullivan. And German was his surname. German Reed is German his was his middle name. It was Thomas German Reed. Ah, middle name. Right. Okay. Um, Conrad's got his hand up. Hello, Conrad. You're muted, Conrad. No, somebody did that. Anyway, um, what was the? That's a very good good talk. It's, it's it highlights the way songs can be uh, changed by filling in the blank. You've got a framework. And then you can change all of these parts. This is what we have in Guy Fawkes, Prince of Sinister, same thing. But my question is about how long does it take from the first known version until you've got parody? And full cell parody. The quick answer is less than a year. That's, that's, that's what I'm finding. It is immediately they're, they're parodying it as if the the, uh, the original was a trigger to start a game. Who can yeah, go up with the best parody? Once it comes out, try to, try to put another one out. Cheap, yeah. A cheap way to make a song. It does, it does, it, it's, some of the dating is very difficult, but they're essentially on top of one another so that it's almost immediately. Yeah, that's, uh, it's, it's very, that's the purpose, to create parodies. But, uh, you know, it's, it, but, it's, but it, I, I would argue that it's it would it, it's also a way of having something to sing that doesn't that that is different that is yours and you can that's right. you can say oh this is nothing to do with your version I I wrote this sell and, sell to some publisher but yeah. the um the interesting thing about these is you can analyze them by assembling all of the parts and dating all of the individual pieces with uh, Prince of Sinisters all these things are mentioned in history. Which you can look up, and then you get a time bracket. But then before that, what was before that? What was the first one? Is also somehow reflected in the, in the subsequent ones. It's, there's some something that is remaining the same from an earlier parody. I haven't really yet figured that one out totally, but there's, there's there's residue, so it might not be an accurate date based upon events listed, because there there's some that come down from others. So it's, it's a very interesting point, way to an, an, analyze these things rather than just uh, throw them out there. Thanks, thanks. Uh, yeah. It shows how things were speeding up in the, you know, popular culture, pop music, all of that stuff in the mid 19th century, literally was speeding up. You know, there were lots more songs coming out. There were lots more venues. It, it seemed like it was, taking on a, a completely new um, pace, as it were, in the thing, you know, you really could get broadsides out and, and sheet music and stuff tumbling out on top of each other. I think I think this is an interesting song because it's 1860, which is, for me, relatively early to be spreading that fast. Um, I may be, you know, I'm used to it in, in the 1870s and 1880s, but one of the reasons I found this song interesting is that it was the late 1850s, 1858 is first performed, been performed in Australia, um, sort of 12, 18 months later, um, but yeah. So that's before the real music hall, commercial music hall set in. Well, that depends on <laughs> how, you, how you define music hall. There, 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 there were things called music halls, um, where the song was being sung, but they weren't always musicals as we understand them no. now. Um, but yeah, that, that's a that's another can of, right. can of worms. But the, it is it is it's interesting that it's a song that started out in respectable in the respectable end of the entertainment industry and transferred very quickly into the more distress disreputable. But Vic's got his hand up. Yes, Vic. Last question from Vic. Well, just, just a comment, really. Um, certainly, I mean, 
new songs to old tunes is nothing new in the 19th century, but I, I do think there is a speed thing going on. I mean, I've looked at the tunes to some of the Tyneside singers. You mentioned George Ridley. I mean, they're often a year or two old, the tunes. They just happen to be popular at the time and they sort of jump on the bandwagon. So I think Steve's point about the speed is, you know, it's not a new phenomenon, but I do think it is increasing in speed in, in the mid 19th century. Yes, yeah. thank you, Vic. All right, to move on, John. Yes, thank, thanks very much again, John, as always. Very interesting. And we have another young man from Canada. Well, we have Martin anyway. Um, he's going to talk about Canada. Over to you, Martin, for our third paper. Yeah, just a little technical detail. I need to uh, mute Conrad just in case. Okay, by the 1950s, Helen Creighton had been collecting folk songs in Nova Scotia, Cape Breton and Prince Edward Island for more than 20 years. She wanted to explore the northern coast of the Bay of Fundy and its hinterland, but she regarded New Brunswick as being the territory of Louise Manny. Her fellow collector told her that she had no plans to explore southern New Brunswick, so Creighton made a series of collecting expeditions to the area. Some of the songs that she found it there were published in her book, Maritime Folk Songs in 1951, sorry, 61. And then 10 years later, she published Folk Songs from Southern New Brunswick, which contained 123 versions of 118 titles. Martin, Martin, can, are you meant to be sharing your... Not friend? yet. No, yeah, okay. Carry on. Carry on then. Believe it or not, for a change, I know what I'm doing. All right, carry on. <laughs> now, Sean and I had visited the area in 2016, and when I saw a copy of the book, I did buy it. It was a good quality paperback, but while the book block was sound, the cover was in poor condition, so it became an instant bookbinding project. Um, not a big job, but there was a small complication to be dealt with in that the original book had four flexi discs containing 17 songs in the back. So I needed to build a special little pocket in the back to hold them. And having done all that work, I put it on the shelf and forgot about it for a while. But recently I thought I'd actually like to listen to those discs. And so I recorded them um, onto digital recordings um, and uh, having listened to those I thought so so much good about them that I actually reread the book um, and uh, so I thought I'd share some of my findings about the book and share with you some of the discoveries that I made and uh, I'm going to tell you about some of the singers who appear on them Oh, heavens, let's just get that back a minute. Uh, share screen, share sound. Sorry, bear with me a moment. It's crept down. Right. I've got to get me. Okay, you should be seeing that now. You are. Yeah. Good. Okay. So Helen Creighton first visited New Brunswick in the summer of 1953, when she went up to Miramichi and Newcastle to spend some time with Louise Manny and to meet and record some of her singers up there. On her way, she stopped at Sackville where she met Jeannie Leslie, who'd been a housekeeper at Allison University for many years. Jeannie had grown up in Aberdeenshire, and while she was at school, had learned a 25 verse version of Sir Patrick Spens as a recitation. And she repeated that for Creighton, and it's actually in the book. But she also told the collector that she hadn't known that the ballad had ever been sung. She also said, my grandmother was blind at a very early age and she knew all the folk songs and she would sit and sing them to me. I love them 
and I think she sensed that I did. This one I've heard her sing all my life. It should be sung just as if she was waiting to go to the gallows tree. She was just soliloquizing. So let me play you. Let me play you that song, Mary Hamilton, as sung by Jeannie Leslie. There will be the three. There was Mary beaten and Mary Satan and Mary Carmichael and me. Oh, little did my mother think when first she cradled me that I would be safe for fame or hang on a gallows tree. Yes, dream there were for Mary, this next there will be but three. There was Mary beaten and Mary Satan and Mary Carmichael and me. They will tie a neck in the room, my in, and they'll nail at me see to thee. They'll never let on to my father and mother but that I'm a wallower of sea. Yes, dream there were for Mary, this next there will be but three. There was Mary beaten and Mary Satan, and Mary Carmichael and me. <laughs> Shortly after Creighton returned from her visit to Miramichi, Angelo Dornan wrote to her from Elgin, saying that he knew a great many songs and thought it would be a fine thing if she went to New Brunswick to record them. He added, I can put you up overnight. I have a fine wife and six boys, so will not annoy you with proposals of marriage. Creighton was, though, very busy and was not able to make the trip to Elgin until the following summer. She arrived at the Dornan's house on the 31st of August 1954, and the following day she wrote in her journal, 25 songs in two days is a lot of songs. Many more were to come, and on this and subsequent visits, she obtained 135 songs from him at which point she, he said that he had reached the bottom of the barrel. During her stay, Dornan also introduced her to some other singers in the neighbourhood, notably his friend and neighbour William Ireland, a blacksmith from whom she noted 20 songs. Clary Croft recently interviewed Dornan's son Michael and discovered that his father's given name was actually Michael Angelo Dornan. His great-grandfather had come to Canada from County Antrim in Northern Ireland, and his maternal grandfather from County Cork at the opposite end of the country. Angelo's father was a farmer in Elgin and a fine singer. During the winter months he'd go logging and would sing and learn new songs in the logging camps. Angelo listened to his father's songs and picked up as many as he could learn. At the age of 19, though, he went to Western Canada to farm. He then had no occasion to sing to others, and only sang while out with his horses. His wife later said that she'd never heard him sing a folk song during those years. But when he reached his mid-sixties, he sold up and bought a farm in Elgin, sight unseen. He reconnected with old friends and they encouraged him to remember the songs that his father had sung. 
many of the songs that he knew were of Irish origin. Here's an example which he called, There was a wealthy farmer. While the first two lines may seem very familiar, I've not yet found another example with the same plot. It's a pleasant variation on the Irish emigration story. There was a wealthy farmer who lived here nigh by. He had an only daughter, on her I cast an eye. This lovely maid was gaily decked, most wondrous to behold. And in her dress a fortune sold, five hundred pounds in gold. Said I, my dear Eliza, if with me you'll agree, before we leave old Ireland, we'll go and married be. You'll have servants far to wait on you, and money in great store. And we'll smile on fortune's cruelty when we're in Baltimore. I took, took a farm on the plain and clear. Sorry, lost the end of that. Go back. Not sure whether we can get back to that. Okay, we'll go on to the next slide. Um, that's a shame. It's a lovely song. That comes of uh, trying to let someone in while I was actually doing a presentation. <laughs> um, Creighton would describe how he would sing. I should tell you how the story ended, um, because after they'd um, successfully farmed the land, um, he wrote back to her father in Ireland saying, right, we can give you your money back. We don't know whether the daughter had actually stolen the money, but uh, in any case, they offered it back to the father. And he said, no, hang on to it and give it to your firstborn son, which I thought was a nice touch. Now, Creighton described how Angelo would sing, seated, bent over with a hand over one eye, twiddling a stick between his legs. She wrote of the quality of the embellishments to his songs learned from his father. She said that the men in the lumber camps had an abundance of time in the evenings and liked long songs to fill it. Some of these were learned by young Angelo and the song, The True Lover's Discourtion, with 28 line stanzas was recorded by Creighton without a break in 20 minutes. Over the next decade, Creighton revisited New Brunswick, southern New Brunswick at least once each year. When Folk Songs from Southern New Brunswick was published in 1971, it had 122 songs from 17 singers. The map shows the locations where the songs in the book were found. 70 of those 122 songs were heard from Angelo Dornan. In her introduction to the book, Creighton joked, the volume might have been called the Dawn and Book of Folk Songs because the lyrics and melodies of one singer are preeminent. It's not surprising then that eight out of the 17 tracks on the discs that accompanied the book came from Angelo Dornan, but there are some nice performances from other singers and I'll play you a couple of examples. Scott Stewart came from St Andrews on the eastern edge of the area. As a younger man, he'd been a popular entertainer, playing fiddle and clarinet and telling stories many learned from a seagoing uncle. There are four tracks of his on the discs and a further two in the book. I'm going to play you his version of Stormy Weather. 
Oh, up comes the heron, and the king of the sea jumps onto the quarter deck helm to leave her its stormy weather, its very thick weather. And when the wind blows, it brings all hands together, so boys will heave her too. Then up comes the shark with his three rows of teeth, and he says to the cook, I'll take care of your beef, for it's stormy weather, it's very thick weather. And when the wind blows, it brings all hands together, so boys will heave her too. Then up comes the salmon, as bright as the sun, jumps onto the quarter deck, fires the lee gun, for it's stormy weather, it's very thick weather. And when the wind blows, it brings all hands together, so boys will heave her too. Then up comes the cod, with his large chuckle head, jumps into the chains, takes a cast with the lead, but it's stormy weather, it's very thick weather, and when the wind blows, it brings all hands together, so boys, we'll heave her to. Another interesting singer is a Mr. C. E. Inkpen, who lived in Pudiac. He came from England, and Creighton reported that his Cockney accent made it difficult to make out the words of his version of the Oxford tragedy. And I would like to hear the recording of his song, There Was a Young Lady of Cluer, since the verse that I know starting with that line is a rather rude memory. But I'll play you a snatch of his rather charming version of My Pretty Maid. Oh, where are you for going to my pretty maid? Oh, where are you going to, my pretty maid? I'm going to milking, sir, I say, sir, I say, sir, I say. I'm going to milking, kind sir, I say. Can I come with you, my pretty maid? Can I come with you, my pretty maid? Yes, as you please, kind sir, I say, sir, I say, sir, I say. Just as you please, kind sir, I say. Oh, what is your father, my pretty maid? Oh, what is your father, my... For my final example from the discs, I'll go back to Angelo Dorman and play you another song that would have appealed to him because the Irishman comes out on top. Creighton noted this as John Bull, Irishman and Scotchman. It's to be found on broadsides by several English printers, including Catmac, as Paddy McGee's Dream. Most of the collected instances, though, are in the Americas, though it has been found once in Ireland. I discovered from John Baxter's website that Paddy's Dream was written in about 1863 by George Ware and performed by himself as well as Harry Clifton and Sam Collins. Enjoy the story. John Bull, he was an Englishman and went to tramp one day with three pence in his pocket for to take him a long way. He traveled on for many a mile, yet no one did he see till he fell in with an Irishman whose name was Paddy McGee. Good morning, Pat, said John to him, where are you going to? Said, Pat, I hardly know myself, I want a job to do. Have you got any money about you? Said John Bull unto Pat. Said, Pat, it's the only thing I'm lacking, for I haven't got a rap. Then they overtook a Scotchman, who like them was out of work. To judge by his looks, he was hard up and as hungry as a Turk. Can you lend me a shilling, Scotty? At last, said Paddy McGee. I'm sorry I canna, said the Scotchman, for I hain't got ain Bobby. Said the Englishman, I three pence have, what can we do with that? Buy three penny worth of whiskey, it will cheer us up, said Pat. They didn't do that, said the Scotchman, I'll tell you the best to do. We'll buy three penny worth of oatmeal, and I'll make some nice burgoo. I think we had better buy a loaf, the Englishman did say. And then in yonder haystack, our hunger sleep away. 
We can get a drink of water from yonder purling stream. And the loaf will be his in the morning who has had the biggest dream. The Englishman dreamt by the morning ten million men had been. For ten years digging a turnip up the largest ever seen. At last they got the turnip up by working night and day. Then it took five million horses this turnip to pull away. Said the Scotsman, I've been dreaming, 50 million men had been. For 50 years making a boiler, the largest ever seen. What was it for, said the Englishman, was it made of copper or tin? It was made of copper, said the Scotsman, for to boil your turnip in. Said the Irishman, I've been dreaming, an awful great big dream. I dreamt I was in a haystack by the side of a purling stream. I dreamt that you and Scotty were there, as true as I'm an oaf. By the powers I dreamt I was hungry, so I got up and ate the loaf. <laughs> now this presentation is focused particularly on the book, but I'd like to take a few moments to cover the broader picture of Helen Creighton's collecting in southern New Brunswick. In the Finding Aid for Helen Creighton on the Canadian Museum of History website, there's a list of recordings made by her. While I'm unsure that this is complete, I've found more than 300 recordings made in southern New Brunswick from 25 singers. And this includes 156 recordings of Angelo Dornan, some of them repeats of songs collected before. Not all of her singers gave virtuoso performances. She said of Mr. Elder's performance of The Screeching Owl, the singer has little music in his voice. This is probably a nice song. There were the occasional difficulties noted against recordings. For example, the background grunts in the last two songs are from an inebriated man who came to the house and sat next to the singer. She did record a few locally made songs, particularly on Grand Manon, and met several Francophone singers as well as Danish immigrants. She also recorded fiddle music from some of her singers like Scott Stewart, who we met earlier, and Mrs. Clem O'Connor. She also recorded some chin music, the name they used for what we call diddling, for dancing when there were no instruments around. Angelo Dornan was one of those who gave her an example of chin music, so let's hear a snatch of it. This is not on the discs that came with the book. Amazing. Um, only one breath, though there might have been a bit of circular breathing going on. Now, Kenneth Lovelace, in his review of folk songs from southern New Brunswick in the 1973 Folk Music Journal, said that it was heartening to realise that in 1960, songs were being discovered in outlying places that were as fine as anything collected by Cecil Sharp and his colleagues. This has been a rapid and rather superficial examination of just one part of Helen Creighton's collecting that comes rather later in her story than the main focus of my studies, which has been on the wor her work with Doreen Senior in the 1930s. I am again indebted to Clary Croft, who helped me with some of the biographical detail on Angela Dornan. I'm looking forward to getting back to Halifax again to complete my study of Helen Creighton's papers and her correspondence with Doreen Senior after the delay caused by COVID. It'll be great. Thank you.
Thank you, Martin. That was excellent, as always. Lovely. Try and, uh, oh, I lost my. Uh, Your mouse is over there. I know it is. Said at the beginning, you knew what you were doing. I know. There we go. That's, there's everybody. Well done. Thank you. Anybody who's got any questions or comments? I think that um, Paddy's dream was the origin of the phrase, let them eat turnip. <laughs> so British people will understand, Americans may not. Um, <laughs> anybody, anybody got any questions uh, or comments for Martin? Actually, we're, we are running out of time, but anybody got anything to say? No. I mean, they they are stunning recordings, aren't they? They are very they're, good. They're um, good excellent singers and excellent recordings. <laughs> what I'm going to try and do is, um, is I'm going to try and no, I can't. It's not going to let me do it. What I will do. Um, is I've put all 17 recordings on a Google Drive file. Um, they are copyright, so I'm not going to leave them there much more than a couple of weeks. Um, but I'll send the uh, um, link for that to Elaine, and she'll include that with the notes of the meeting when she sends them out. So there we go. Hey. That would be excellent because my, my record player won't play them because they the automatic cutoff goes halfway through them. Yeah. You know what I mean? So uh, that, that would be very nice to have digital copies. Good. Anybody got any any more comments, questions? We have two minutes. Yes. Alan seems to have his hand up. Alan, have you got your hand up? It's off the screen. Alan, you're muted. You're muted, Alan. Yeah. Sorry about that. I couldn't find my hand thing. Uh, I'm just wondering about uh, as a Canadian, <laughs> um, about uh, Edith Folk, uh, who was also um, a folklorist and collected a lot of ballads. And I was wondering if there's any, if you've come across, Martin, any kind of connection between Creighton and, um, are you familiar with Edith F O? It's F O W K E. Yeah, I, I know about Edith. Um, yeah. She and Helen did correspond. I have to say, Helen was not over from over fond of Edith, but they did manage to work together a bit. Um, okay. And there was some overlap between their work. But didn't didn't Helen Creighton regard uh, Edith's work with sort of left wing folkies? She was, yeah, and vice versa. I think uh, that uh, Edith thought uh, Creighton was a little conservative, shall we say. <laughs> we should have a paper on that at least that would be that would be good fun <laughs> well thank you to our three speakers excellent presentations as always thank you everybody for coming and i'll repeat my uh, uh, next one is the 23rd of april not the 13th as i said at the beginning 23rd of april uh where we'll have at least two maybe three speakers but we're going to start half an hour early for our business meeting for those of you who, who really want to know what's in the bank account and and all of that sort of stuff so thanks for coming uh and keep safe and keep well and we'll see you again in uh april cheerio everybody bye bye